All right, guys. So you know that it's very rare that I start our podcast episodes with someone's bio. But for Simon Jeffries, I'm going to start with Simon's bio because where this podcast starts is so hilarious that you're automatically your face is going to hurt from laughing at how ridiculous this one is. It's such a great episode. So Simon is a mindset coach who combines his elite military background in UK special forces with neuroscience and psychology to build systematic programs, which remove limitations, unblock peak mental and physical performance and forge mental toughness. So Simon is an absolute powerhouse. I had the occasion of meeting him and we'll tell you that whole story within the podcast episode. So without further ado, we're diving deep into mindset and performance and what it takes to truly create your story. If you haven't already, make sure that you subscribe on YouTube, Google Play, over on Spotify, as well as Apple. Give us a review. We really appreciate it. Um, and sit back, relax, and hop in to this episode of the Mind Rise Podcast. I don't see why we wouldn't start at the Carney Encyclopedia salesman spot. <laughs> Feels yeah, like the great that's... part of the story to start with. <laughs> that's actually what I've never, I don't think I've ever talked about on a podcast. I probably should because it holds so many of the mes- lessons equal to anything I did in the military. Perhaps oh. in many ways, it was actually harder than I think in the military. So do you want a brief, a brief rundown of my <laughs> trip oh, into yeah. selling educational books in the year 2000 and 2003? Three, I think it was 2003 2004 in Midwest Indiana knocking on doors for eight hours a day trying to flog these books right <laughs> which was yeah right well but no I think that it is like an awesome place to start in the story because the truth is like I think everybody and you and I talked about that so for everybody who's tuning in Simon and I, like we crossed paths a bit when um, I was running the retreat in Greece and he was actually also running a retreat for his company, The Natural Edge at the same time. So both retreats that were supposed to happen like 200 times and then COVID hit and then it finally happened once the seas calmed down. Um, And it wasn't until we got on a ferry leaving the retreats to, and then sat next to each other on the boat. And we were going from Amorgos to Mykonos Mm -hmm. that the story started to unfold of exactly who Simon is and exactly what Simon does. And he had me absolutely captivated when he convinced me that, you know, it was perfectly fine and normal for him to be a, uh, a carny and a book salesman. Um, And then didn't you also like sell cable or something? Yeah, we sold phone packages. So we, after we quit the book selling because it was a little bit cult-like and we'd had enough doing a dance in a car park after we'd eaten breakfast every day where we'd read out a sales passage to each <laughs> sales passage to each other with our manager. We quit that. And then, yeah, ended up with a crew who kind of rent themselves out to whatever selling. At this point, it was AT&T. And as I said, it was kind of, yeah, it paints the picture. You turn up on the first day and it's like these kind of office blocks you rent out, but pretty downtrodden. The lead guy had a pet ferret that he had in there. They're showing us how to break into the other offices with credit cards, like swiping down the doors. So <laughs> it was an interesting summer. Well, but I think that the reason why I love kind of like starting the story in the middle is because I, like you and I talked about on the boat, when you're when you're running a business, especially an online business, people judge who you are more most often by what they can see, right? And you sh- ha- we were you know trading stories about social media and our communities. And if it's okay if I share, like mm. Simon had said, yeah, the the posts that get the most likes, I either am in full military gear, which was part of his um, his career background, or I'm shirtless. And it's just like, those tell a story about who you are, but it doesn't tell the entirety of the story of how you came to doing the work that you do now when it comes to mindset and even like what it really means to have a natural edge. Because I think that 
without those stories of the past, you know, carnivals and all, that we, we, we need to take with us those experiences and those perspectives that lend to, to the bigger picture of who you actually are and the work that you do in the world. Yeah, it's, and it's something we've sort of learned along the way or come, I guess, come to terms with or found our integrity within it. So when we first started the online business, it was very, it was actually, that was much harder. So naturally, I don't, I hate, always hated having photos taken. My mum will laugh at this. I always kicked up a fuss having to have a photo taken. I hated drama at school. So I've never been, I guess, into the side of things where you're putting yourself out there in that sense. And so even simple things like making videos or putting pictures up felt more uncomfortable than anything I'd ever done in the military, which seems, you know, might seem bizarre to a lot of people, but it comes down to exactly like you said, it's that it's your identity and your personality and what you find uncomfortable versus, you know, the beauty of everyone, the human race, I guess, we're all different. So when we first started and we decided to do a coaching business and, and to help people and through that, you start to see that, yeah, any picture, because it's something from special forces and so it's a bit different and there's obviously the credibility that comes with that, or if it's a topless picture, because it, you know, it's the world we live in, it's getting oh, it eyes, does, it is. It's eyes on, on, on what you're doing. So right. it's, and it's, and same with the marketing, like the way we wrote our copy and the messages, you know, we strayed away from in the beginning, all of the classic, what you should do with marketing, because it felt too disingenuous. But then what we actually realized was if you can't get people, as long as you maintain integrity, with what you're actually producing, the coach you, you're doing. And you can still do it with the writing, but you need to use those tactics because if you can't get someone to see your stuff or come in and at least try your things, you're not going to help anyone. And it's funny, I know a couple of coaches who complain a lot because the, the flip side of it is because the barrier to entry is so low now with social media and everything, you also get a lot of shit out there, basically, that is just oh, nonsense. Sure. It, it, in, in all spheres, you know, across across everything from people selling like scammy money stuff to diet pills, all the rest of it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it's that two sides of the coin. And you get people, you know, I know coaches who are very good coaches in the sense of their knowledge, like so, so in depth and good at helping people. And they hate all of the stuff they see, but then they just complain about it. They're not actually willing to... And it's almost like a disservice because if you're not, you have that knowledge and you're not able to help people because they're not willing to learn that side of things to put themselves out there, which, you know, I guess it's a choice, but to me, it's like, if you're going to sit and complain, we'll do something about it, create something where you're going to actually have a message where you can be genuine and help those people. But yeah, you definitely have that, I guess, every business is sales, isn't it? At the end of the day. <laughs> Right, right, right. And I think it's, it's sales, it's connection, it's having a conversation. Um, mm. And so for you, in order for you and your business partner to, to fully show up in an authentic way, a way that feels like this is me delivering value and in my integrity, like what was the path that brought you to doing the work that you do now? So I guess that, that's probably a good segue for the full uh, an abbreviated version of the full story. So we ended up where we are through a series of twists and turns. So my background was after selling books and working for a state fair, selling tickets as a carny folk, um, finished university. And I, for me, I was, I was always going to join the military. That was what I was always going to do. I need to find it. There's a picture of me somewhere. I'm like seven or eight years old at school and you're holding a science. Like when I leave school, and mine was when I leave school, when I grow up, I'm going to be a Royal Marines commando. So it was even specific down to the regiment I was going to join, which and I can't really tell you. Honestly, the, the best I can put my finger on it is too many 80s action movies <laughs> with combination with growing up on a, on a small farm. So just being outdoors all the, all the time. So I did join the military. I joined the Royal Marines. Um, 
went through that basic training, went to a unit, um, and then I went down the pathway of, so first of all, signals for UK Special Forces, so still a Royal Marine, but working with that group, and then did full selection um, for the SBS, which is the equivalent of your guys' um, dev group, Navy SEALs, mm-hmm. yeah. who we do exchanges with. Um, did three tours of Afghan, did everything that I wanted to do, decided it was time to leave, had no real plan. I just knew that where I was wasn't really going to develop me any further. And it was that, I guess, search for a new challenge. Left and ended up in London doing a corporate role because my partner at the time got a job in London and realised very quickly, like within a week, two weeks, I was like, nope, no, this is just not me. It's not going to work for me for the rest of my life. And so I then began the journey of searching for, well, okay, what do I want to do? How do I want my life to look? Um, and it basically ended upon business in some form so that I could be my own boss and specifically online business because the freedom of that really appealed to me and my values. Um, and, you know, classic. So John, um, who I do the natural edge with, and basically I've been on this journey with since the military. So we met in 2009 and have known each other since then. I, he was leaving the military. I rang him up. I was like, you're going to hate having a job. Let's start a business. So we started that path, read all the books on entrepreneurship and businesses. We're like, yeah, probably two years. We'll make loads of cash. Easy. <laughs> made, made all the mistakes I mean, I didn't, I don't think I told you about this on the bus. We had everything from, so imported stuff from China to sell on Amazon. I've got this bespoke lemon squeezer still in the house that I sold (laughs) at one point. We had, at one point we had some guy, we were doing this like, I don't even know how to describe it. It's called match betting. So in the UK, you can place bets with two different agencies and no matter the outcome, because it's these offers, special offers they give, you'll come out with a little bit of profit. And so okay. these change all the time. You could probably make, I don't know, maybe two or three grand a month max from it. But in order to do that, you'd have to be doing it. You'd have to spend like five or six hours a day. So we found, I don't know how we found him. We found this dude in like Bosnia or somewhere who kind of knew how to do it. And we're like, his name is Vedran. We're like, you do all the kind of searching for the deals because you sure. can't do it from abroad you need to be in the UK I had like I bought a hundred quid laptop that I had running 24 hours a day that he could log in remotely to like using a VPN to place all these bets and they were like we'll split the we'll split the money at the end of the month we used to do Skype calls with him and he was like honestly it looked like a, a Soviet block Russian cell it was like a metal frame bed he'd be in there smoking a cigarette and a white <laughs> singlet <laughs> I was like veteran how's it been going this month <laughs> He's like, yeah so we did all these kind of schemes but the point was we were chasing cash we were like oh we'll do this and we'll make money and that that's what's got us there and none of it worked because I I just don't think it does work when you do that and we ended up blowing all our savings made all the mistakes you could and actually ended up after a couple of years my relationship ended left London and we both ended up in our mid-30s living back at my parents farm so it was kind of like a stepbrother set up um working from a parent's dining room table we shared a car that costs 350 pounds like we were both single at the time so if we wanted to organize dates and we use i don't know whatever it was the dating apps at the time we'd organize them at the same place and time so we could share the car to, to, get, <laughs> to get there um so we went, went through went through all of that and it was that point i guess the low point where you kind of like feel like you've gone all the way back down to the bottom of the ladder we just said let's just do something you know we can't get any worse than where we are let's just do something we actually cared about and for us we've always been even with the military we were the guys who you know reading the books and performance psychology looking for that edge in our training all those things it's just been a very natural interest for both of us um Mm -hmm. and so we're like well let's start something we actually care about and in the beginning our idea was again there's so much rubbish out there and also everyone's teaching things in, they're treating the body like a silo as in separate silos so it's just a training plan or it's just a diet plan um but no one's looking at sleep your stress levels like circadian rhythm how all of these things tie in together so we're like essentially we wanted to do a one and done program come to us and we'll cover all of this yeah. and that's what the natural edge started off as but we just learned over the journey that one 
that's very hard to market because there's a reason nobody sells it like that. It's just too many messages intertwined. So although that is essentially what we need, it's very hard to sell that as a package. It's much easier to bring someone in on one thing and then gradually give them the other bits. And then through it all, really what we saw was when you make a shift with mindset, everything else is easier. So all the behaviors around eating or training or whatever it is focus that people want to achieve, you make the shift with mindset, the behaviors follow. Right, and it's also right, right. really more where our interest was. So went down that route and that's where we are now. Um, so teaching, that's what we focus on is, is just coaching mindset. I'm sure you've all heard the saying, nothing changes if nothing changes. And that's true. It's really hard to make change in our life without taking the time to actually look at the way that we're showing up in the world and the thoughts that we have that really dictate the way that we show up in the world. That is why we created the 90 day elevate journal. You're definitely going to want to grab this and it's available now on Amazon. The 90 day elevate journal is essentially designed for you to take a deep dive into what it really means to rise transform and lead grab your copy for less than 20 bucks you can always visit www.themindrise.com forward slash elevate or check it out in the show notes but you need to grab your copy of the 90 day journal now and really elevate to the next level I love like the in and outs of the story when I uh, invited Simon on the podcast I had said like okay, we want to see like what's behind the kimono. We want to see like the, the actual journey because, you know, so often we have this misconception of people. We see what their Instagram looks like and it's like, oh, you know, they just arrived this way. And I don't believe that. I believe yeah. that there are twists and turns and ups and downs and, and things that we learn along the way. So I'm curious, like what's, and I want, I want, to, I want to tap into that mindset aspect for you. Like what is that relationship that you have um, between trust and effort, right? Because sometimes like we could just like slog away and we're trying to like you had said, like chase the dollar um, versus mm -hmm. like trusting that this is going to work out or trusting that I'm pointing in the right direction or like trusting in, in the relationship that we create with ourselves. Like what is that dynamic for you? It is, it's a really good question. For me, it always comes down to the path that you're on, the more it aligns with your core values the easier it is to stay on that path the less it aligns the more you're going to have to force it with motivational willpower which is not infinite and to be honest like this over these last five years this was this journey has been far harder than anything I did in the military I take my hat off to anyone who starts a business and I something I've come to realize that it doesn't matter what sector you're in just it's just tough whatever you're going into it is hard. Right. And I think you only stick at it if it is really something that is aligned with your values and you care about it. Because we've had so many dark moments on this path where you're just like, geez, again, it's going wrong again. Like, can we pay ourselves this month again? Like month after month. And that if 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 you don't have that real passion for it, you because it'd just be so much easier to get a job. Um, however, I say that. It's the whole easy choices, hard life, hard choices, easy life, because I say it would be the easy choice. Yes, practically, it'd be easy for me tomorrow to stop all this, get rid of all the hassle and stress, go and get a nine to five job, get told what to do. But what I'd trade off was that I would hate it and I'd be miserable. So I'd still, it wouldn't solve anything. Right, um, it's not aligned. So I think that alignment is really key. And then within that, because you can... It's that understanding, and, and this comes down to, I guess, mindset again, of you understanding yourself and also being able to step out of yourself and get the wider perspective and perspective on the picture. Because you can, it's understanding when you're hammering away at something and you kind of know that if you just keep going, you are near that point or just blindly hammering away and right. you're on the complete path. And, you know, I guess that's the advantage of, us as mindset coaches in the same way that business coaches are helpful because they can step in and look at their like, what are you doing? I can, and they can see it so much clearer because they're not emotionally involved. They're not sucked into the day to day and they can see the strategic level. Sure. Same in a battle, you know, the military being able to take that, we call it a tactical pause. So in the heat of battle, when things are going on, if you're just sucked in on the tactics, 
and you're missing the wider picture and where all the different components are on that battlefield, you're going to make decisions that end badly. Whereas whoever has got the command and control is always that tactical bound behind outside of the fighting, ideally. And just having that same as the generals back in the day, Battle of Waterloo and all that, you know, they're always up on the hill and then sending messages out because they can see the full picture. And that's, I guess, really what we're trying to do in mindset work, isn't it? A lot of the time it's bringing true perspective and removing all of our biases and emotions from whatever it is that we're looking at. Right, but you make a good point because I think that those biases, those emotions, those past experiences, trauma, narrative, beliefs that aren't even yours, they, they're passed down of multiple generations. I mean, there's so much that goes into what's happening up here. So if we know that the self-talk cycle essentially is our words, you know, they, they dictate how we feel and our feelings then call the shots on our actions. I'm just curious about like, how, what your approach is when it comes to changing this story up here, because we know yeah. if this is crap, our, we're going to feel like crap and then our actions aren't going to get us anywhere. Yeah, it's just funny enough, we were having this conversation, we, so we had our group, a group coaching call today. Um, and one of the things I always say, because it's also so easy to, to judge ourselves and exactly what you said there, the point I always make is that that's almost like the easy way out almost like a cop out to judge ourselves because we are the way we are for so many complex since the day we were born our education right. our environment every single experience we've had based personalities evolution all of these complex facts over years and years have got us to where we are so it's too right. easy just to go oh you're rubbish you're like hang on <laughs> there's a lot of complexity going on here and so the first thing that we always do whenever we're doing the work is just encourage people a to see it as a process so, so our biggest mantra we call it moving average and that is that everything in life is a process and you don't need perfection we're always trying to chase perfection you know the perfect week the perfect routine the perfect diet when it doesn't exist because life just doesn't work like that and so if you can start to flip things and just we just, you basically just need a positive moving average. So overall, have you made enough small choices or wins? Maybe you couldn't do a 60 minute workout, but you went for a 10 minute walk. That's glad to do moving average, like all these little choices. Right. And if you can always keep that in the positive, you're going to be moving forwards. So a, that it's a process and that no matter what you do, you have to have a bad first draft like in anything. Right. You'll get better at making a burst bad first draft. So as we do the work, you know, as you evolve your mindset, all the rest of it, when situations come up, then you'll make better choices because of your the work you've done. But it's still going to be a first draft and it still won't be as good as the iterations that you have. Um, and then really it's awareness. So it's exactly it's getting people. You can't do anything until you're actually aware of what that self-talk is, which stems from what your beliefs are. So until you really understand how you see things and what your narrative is of the world and around specific things what's your narrative around finances around money around success around relationships all these different angles um because that's something i definitely will learn going through it mm. having come from a special forces background where you're in that bubble and then that world right and yes you do have a strong mindset but that's only in one narrow definition I think I said to you on the boat, you know, you only need to look at look at me guys in the military or in those extreme environments that are great in that job, but then have sure. relationships that are falling apart. All this stuff, you know, and I definitely when I looked at my relationships and how my mindset around them, it was definitely very fixed. And I was definitely, you know, not having difficult conversations that I should have been that actually would have improved things. So that was sort of a big learning curve for myself going through that process as well. Right, right, right. But someone like, why do you think that we just blindly, and, and some, and this isn't a huge generalization, but by and large, like we have times when we just blindly go through life, not even paying attention to the narrative that's calling the show. Like we're just not even making the connection that these words are equaling these actions. Why do you think that is? And like, what do you think for, for most people in your experience, like what's the wake up call? What gets people because like a high, come, come on back? 
a topless picture on Instagram with a post about it. Uh, <laughs> Nailed just, it! <laughs> it's because, I'll tell you exactly why it is, it's because, and again, this is probably our biggest message, mindset is a skill. It is not, so yeah, we have our base characteristics and all the rest of it, so much of it is learned and anyone can make improvements, but we don't teach it like, yeah, until you're actually, you know, the only way that, so everything that I've learned to now is just through piecing, reading different books, going through different programs, having mentors myself, and then piecing it together into what we teach. But unless you're doing that, or unless maybe you're in a sports world where you have sports psychologists and the rest of it, for most people, they'll get snippets from maybe it's a TED talk they'll see or something on a podcast that's something they'll talk about. So they'll get kind of little pieces of the puzzle, but never in the same way that, say, health and fitness now. There's so much information out there that most people have a pretty good idea, although it's still hard. And this is the other factor. It can still be hard to implement, even if you have the knowledge, because our environment is basically set up to screw us. You know, like right now, we've got devices that we're connected to 24 seven, which messes up our sleep patterns, our brainwave patterns, you know, going, most people in the morning wake straight up and get straight in their phone. And right. alongside everything we do on the mindset work, we do quite a lot around routines and habits, really simple changes that the, the, the difference they make to people is massive. And just giving them that mental headspace where they can even do this kind of work because they're not their brain's basically not on 24 seven, like whirring away on all these other things that they're feeding in. So I think it's a mixture right. of education, just not understanding how to do this stuff and the environment we're in, where it is just like, how many people now, everyone's always on the go. Like how many people stop, take that time, just go for that walk or just, just no one does it. Right, to disconnect and then reconnect to ourselves. Yeah. It's interesting. I was uh, recently um, reading something around overwhelm. And one of the arguments that they made, which I thought was so interesting, and you're the first person I've gotten to talk to about this, so I'm tossing this in your direction. But they said that biologically, we were built to withstand the stresses of the community that we were in and the family that we had. Like that is how we are built. So one of the reasons why the argument was made that we are hitting massive amounts of overwhelm is because of the influx of news and things for us to worry about that aren't in our direct community, but you know, a, a crisis over here, a trauma over there, and somebody's being overthrown over here and we're taking in all of that information. And then also the speed at which we're taking in information that we weren't built to process it as quickly as it's coming in. So a lot of the information that's coming in is, is going unprocessed and just sitting in the recesses. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that theory. Yeah, I, I'd say two things into that. One, both things that you said there, the speed at which it's coming in, which essentially comes back to we're always, but we, we're designed to have periods where we're bored. And now, because it's obviously such big money for companies, we can basically never be bored. So we're always looking for stimulation. We're always looking for those, those hits. Coming back to moving average, one of the, again, little changes in the day that I, we encourage people to do is, next time you're stood in line at the airport, the shops, whatever it is, don't reach into your pocket, which will be your first instinct to look on your phone. Just be present. Be bored standing there. Just sit with your thoughts, see what comes up. You don't, because again, it comes back to people think, oh, we need to sit cross-legged for 15 minutes or whatever in a quiet room to meditate. No, you can meditate stood up in a, and, and meditation really is just sitting and watching your thoughts without getting wrapped up in them. And you can right. just do that. You can just concentrate on your breathing, stood in a queue for a couple of minutes. And actually those little changes add up over the day. So I think you're right. A, we don't ever give ourselves time, the brain to defrag, to process things. And yeah, absolutely with the news. Like I gave up the news and I know you did as well years ago because the yeah. fact is, unless it's a critical for your job and there's not many out there where it actually is, you, A, it's just bias. So you're not getting the true picture unless you're going to watch several news channels from different countries, um, east, west, all over. You're never going to get the full picture. So you're just getting a biased 
um, information view on it anyway. Most of it's negative for good reason. It's the most powerful emotion. So it sells. It makes us want to read um, that morbid curiosity. So basically you're getting a whole ton of negativity. And also your brain is whatever you're feeding your brain, that's what it will work on. So creativity is essentially we feed stuff in, percolates in the subconscious, and then you get that aha moment when you've had space. So that's right. why you can't remember someone's name. And then three days later in the shower, when you're not looking at anything or doing anything, or you're on a walk, suddenly it'll pop up to you. Right. If you're watching stuff on, you know, the de-escalate, like the military withdrawal of Afghan, or what happening in Ukraine, like, unless you're a four-star general and it's your job to figure out that strategic moves of what's happening, why the fuck are you watching? Like, your right. brain is going to be trying to figure it out. And if it means that much to you, that you need to, like, go and act on it, right, I need to go and donate to this cause, do that. Like do some research outside of the news, take that action, do it, and then put it aside. Otherwise, it is not helping you or the people or anyone else by you consuming it. It is just useless noise. You'd be far better served, like you said, concentrating on your community, your family, the people around you, your friends. That will serve you and your network, which thus the knock-on effect to serve the world better. Right. right. But, you know, kind of going hand in hand with what you're talking about, that constant space of stimulus, right? Whereas we've forgotten that it's important for us to be bored or for us to not, you know, be engaged, 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 which is inevitably it's burning us out. But don't, don't you think that also makes an argument for us um, put, almost default setting, putting ourselves in a fight or flight state, right? Like, yeah. And the, one of the reasons why I think people overconsume information and news and scroll, 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 and, you know, they've got the TV on, they've got, you know, the music going, they've just, they're reading an article it's just so much at once is almost because, like, there's a high that you achieve on that fight or flight when you're just like all the way up here. And I think we're always seeking to, to maintain that state, but our brain is, and we are, our conscious and our subconscious are not necessarily discerning of what's that that good kind of high that like that excitement high that like you know going rock climbing or walking in the woods something that really like just fulfills us versus the 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 bing 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 stimulus of of just all the information that we take in that almost feels like a slot machine at a casino it's it's yeah, it's instant gratification dopamine. I heard it, you know, as we had a business coach once put it quite well, that instant gratification is an incredibly poor predictor of success. Because, um, you know, the headline is you're going to get more instant quick fixes from your phone, from fast forward food or any of those things than you ever will from working on your business, you know, putting that time in, whatever it is. But the deeper sense of satisfaction will only come from those other things. So, mm -hmm. you know, the satisfaction of training for and running, I don't know, a 5K or 10K, whatever you're doing, sure. versus the ordering and eating a chocolate gatto. Mm -hmm. Like you get an instant hit of, oh, that's really good. And that lasts a minute, maybe. Same with the news. It's why, and again, it comes back to environment. These platforms hire the best mathematicians, statisticians from MIT, Cambridge, Oxford, to design algorithms, to design, you know, the like button, like all these things, everything is carefully tested and designed to make us remain on the platform, to keep scrolling. You know, videos, right. look at TikTok, took off three second videos. You know, they've got shorter and shorter. So right. you've got a conflation of an environment that's fighting against or tapping into our natural evolutionary desires for these things. And unless you become aware of it and take a conscious stand, which is a mix of doing this deep work that we're talking about here, looking inside, combined with designing your environment to work for you instead of against you, have yeah. your phone on airplane mode outside of the room in the night. So it's not there first thing in the morning, have your notifications off rearrange your phone with the app so you don't have them all pinging up like my phone screen is basically everything's put into folders i have a few key ones and everything else is put away so the candy wrapper excitement isn't there all these little things 
I, I get a, 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 James Clear puts it, you know, Atomic Habits puts it very well. So the people that you perceive to have more willpower and motivation, nine times out of 10, just have better systems and habits. They're just right. far better at designing their environment and having you know, basically a setup that they don't fall down the traps that you fall down. And it's not that you're weaker or anyone else is weaker or stronger sure. than anyone else in that sense. Because I, I yeah, I freely talk about it. If at you know, my parents' house, they have a drawer that is full of sweets and chocolates. If I'm there, I will go into it and eat it every single time. And I'll just keep revisiting it all day because it's delicious and it's tapping in and it's available. So I'm going to eat it. Whereas when I'm in my own place, I just don't have it available. And mm -hmm. so you have those little moments in the day where you're a bit bored with your work and you sort of oh, I'll go and you might have a look and then you pretty quickly realize there's nothing there and it just passes anyway. Whereas if it was there, if you're gone, boom, you've eaten it it's too late so we all have those urges it's how much you can control that environment will make a big difference um, right yeah right, right well because like you said mindset um mindset is something that can be trained it can be built it's it is a tool um and if we could actually see our mind or we could see our willpower or we could see our, even our sense of self like we could see a muscle we would see like the, the times in which it's atrophied because we haven't been working it instead we've been scrolling or or you know being on a career path that maybe isn't fulfilling for us but you know we're going through the motions um yeah so it, it's like we can't see it so we don't necessarily know that it needs to continually be worked on it's actually just i'm just going to grab it yeah I'll read it for you perfect i love a show and tell <laughs> let's see what he's got cooking up so just that, the, the fact that you're saying there, that, you know, you can change. So mm -hmm. um, I'm sure he, I hope he won't mind. I'm sure he won't mind me reading this. Um, but yeah. Greg, so he was a, he actually sent me, so this is a, a sheriff's badge. Um, so he was in law enforcement in the States for the longest time. And he, he'd gone through a lot of work before he even joined our program. Um, but he wrote like a, a short letter. He sent it over and he, he said, I wanted to give you this patch as a token of my appreciation um, for all you and the Natural Edge have, have done for me. I wore this patch up until my retirement in 2021. For me, it represents letting go of an identity that I held on to for so long. And I can honestly say now I'm free. Um, and then he sort of goes off with some good regards. But that that's kind of the crux of it. And that's something he's talked about with me um, and he said for the longest time he worked in you know his dad was a cop and maybe even his grandfather so he went into that and that was his whole identity but ended up in a really bad place and he, and he suddenly really you know his own words he was like I was a complete arsehole um, to my wife to you know to people around me to our friends and I couldn't see it for the longest time until he started to do this work and and actually saw it and you know, I take my hat off to him. He's done so much work sort of over the years and he's in a completely different place now and can really see how he was before and how he, how holding on to that identity and that being his only identity had such a negative effect on everything around him. Um, and yeah, it's just the point that like you're saying it, we can change those, those long held beliefs, which often are passed down to us. It's, it's possible to change. We just need to a understand that they're there and the effect they're having, and then be willing to get uncomfortable. I guess that's the thing with mindset work is you, you have to be willing to sit with some discomfort by looking, which we all have at parts of ourselves that we don't necessarily oh. like, but we always like to encourage people through our coaching as, you know, that's a positive thing because without doing that, you can't move forward and it's just a part of the process it comes back to process again you, ha you have to go through that to get to the other side absolutely and uh, yeah i think you hit the nail on the head people will have a death grip um and i know that that was definitely something that i navigated you know before i took the leap into starting my own company was i had the death grip on this identity as like psychotherapist you know you lay on the couch, I sit in the chair, I crack into your brain. Like I knew who I was and who I was supposed to be. And then in, in my interactions with others, they knew who I was based on my title and what I was supposed to, what the interaction was supposed to do or what the experience was supposed to be. And 
I held on to that just white knuckle because this is what I went to school for. Like, this is what I did all those studies for, you know, uh, all this post master's work that I did and trying to peel back the, the, you know, that grip like finger by finger. I hear what Greg is saying in that letter, like the identity that he held on to for so long. And whether that identity is defined by a role that we have, what our business card says, or even like the habits. You know, Simon's just talking about a simple habit of like, do you wake up and check your phone? And then I would argue like, okay, if you wake up and you check your phone, you're allowing whatever this box says to dictate your mood, stepping into a brand new blank slate day. Regardless of what's on your agenda, the lenses with which you're going to continue to look at your day are likely to be clouded by whether it's text message that you didn't like or someone's life that you're feeling jealous of on Instagram or your perception of their life, right? And it's like all of those elements from habits to what the business card says, the role, like they all play into this identity that sometimes we hold on to so stinking tightly because at least in my mind, and I'd be curious, I mean, your thoughts as we wrap things up, but like, it's almost like we're scared to death. If I'm not this, then who in the hell am I? Yeah, which is, and that's, I think the power of, you know, people who do the work on their own, you know, brilliant. And, and if you can do that and work through it, then, then all for you, the power of going through coaching or having a coach. And what I definitely find is the community. So it's not just the coach, it's being around people going through that similar post process is so powerful because it's that support as you go through it. Because as you say, and it is, it's, it's very natural why people hold on to that because it's the fear of what's the other side. If your entire identity is built around that job you've had or, you know, being the party guy, whatever it is for right. you as an individual, it can be hard. And that also what makes it harder is there's, there are going to be people in your life a lot of the time that people don't like change and people don't like it when people step outside, you know, a story I heard from one of our coaching. It's actually when we we're doing the fitness stuff and she was struggling. She was, you know, making changes. She was training, she was changing her diet. And I think she was a nurse or somewhere. And anyway, staff break room, classic. Everyone was always having biscuits with mm -hmm. their drinks. And so she started turning down like, Oh yeah, no, thanks. Not for me. And there was a couple that just, made like snarky comments you know the classic oh now you're getting too thin now you look too thin or little things because when people and you have to remember when you make a change so her, by her saying oh, i don't want a biscuit what she's saying is i don't want a biscuit because i'm making these changes what that other person hears is but you're not having a biscuit so you're saying i'm shit because i'm having one you're saying that i'm unhealthy because i'm having one that's what they hear because that's right. what they're thinking because someone's broken the status quo someone in the group the tribe is doing something different which forces them to question their own behaviors and if people aren't ready to do that which a lot of people aren't it's straight it's just it, it becomes an aggressive like you put up the block the monkey mind you know steps in and it's i'm going to put a barrier up at that it's a cognitive dissonance um right happening so it's yeah it, it's tough um and people do and again it's almost like the sunk sunk cost fallacy where you know with money if we think we've invested so much into a failing scheme we find it hard to stop it like to let go of that and just accept the loss and move on instead of piling more on hoping that the market will come back up Whereas instead of realizing that we're actually getting deeper into the hole and we just need to let it go and move forward. And it's the same with that identity. Like we're mm -hmm. just piling into this old identity that's causing problems, but we've got a fear of what happens when we let go. And so if you've got support around you and you can see other people on the journey who have done it, you know, like Greg, and you can see that it, it's fine the other side, then it makes it so much easier. Right. Absolutely. It does. It does. When, when we have models or, or mentors or community that's inspiring us, it does make it so much easier. Ah, Simon, so good to have you on. Who knew that a knew? Uh, boat ride in the uh, Greek <laughs> yeah. islands were going to end up here? I love it. I love it. Um, all right. So where can everybody find you on the World Wide Web? Where are you hanging out? Where are you shirtless? Tell us all the <laughs> Uh, so it is, so it's always under the natural edge. Um, so it's natural edge on Instagram. Um, Simon Jeffries on LinkedIn. Those are two places that probably post the most. I need to start. I, I just need to get onto Twitter and those places, but not yet. Instagram is probably the easiest. Instagram, Facebook, 
and LinkedIn. And then our website is just the natural edge.com as well. Cool. Well, we'll put everything in the show notes, of course, so you guys can go check out all the links there. Simon, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, it's all about it's all about exercising that mindset. Yeah, it is mindset skill set. <laughs>